One of the joyous memories of my childhood uh, was when my mother would come to wake me up. Um, the birds sing, they seem to sing exceptionally loud and wonderful. And the sun seemed exceedingly bright. And the sky seemed strikingly blue. Uh, my memories are as dear when I think about a morning like this. On the morning of Resurrection Sunday, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was most likely in sorrow because only a day or two ahead of this moment, she had thought about her son being crucified. And as uh, the women walked toward the grave, uh, they walked in sorrow because they remember um, the crucifixion that had taken place earlier, but then everything changed. Angels stood at the tomb and they had a message of resurrection. An empty tomb testified to the fact that he is no longer laying here. Did it suddenly seem like the birds sang exceedingly loud? Did it, did it seem like the sun was exceptionally bright on that day? Did, did, it, did it seem like uh, the sky was strikingly blue? Did the grass sing? Uh, did the earth rejoice? Did the ground seem to pound? He's risen. He is risen Almighty God is risen indeed. I ran across a quote by none other than Mr. Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. You know, he was a believer and he makes this statement. He says, I like to compare the holiday season with how a child listens to a favorite story. The pleasure is in the familiar way the story begins. The anticipation of familiar turns it takes, the familiar moments of suspense, and the familiar climax and ending. What is striking about the story of the crucifixion is that it led to a climax. It led to a striking ending. Christ came to earth not because he wanted to know what it was like to live among human beings, but he came to earth for a work. And what I'd like to give you are just four truths about the resurrection of Christ and his coming to earth. Number one, what is striking is that he came to be the summit, the top, the beginning. Uh, he came to be the suffering servant. Jesus came to earth to suffer for our sins. He came so that we can have an eternal salvation through faith in him. He came, as Isaiah 53 says, to be wounded for our transgressions and to be bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him but by his stripes were healed there are those preachers who say that this line about we are healed is only about it's about physical healing that's not the healing that we needed the most the healing that we needed was to have salvation from the penalty of sin that guaranteed hell for us we needed a salvation that gave us eternal life and guaranteed heaven for us. He came to be the pinnacle of salvation. He came to be the peak. He came to be the climax of salvation for sinners. He came to be the fulfillment of prophecy, like the prophecy in Isaiah 53. Secondly, what is doubly striking is that he came to be the sacrifice. I thought about this, about Jesus being our sacrifice. Every year we come to it, especially as preachers, where we're thinking about the resurrection of Christ. And just for a moment, I'd like to remind you of the story. First, the disciples deserted Jesus. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, they begin to run. Uh, you know, there's people who will stand with you. They'll be your friend. They'll say, hey, we're side by side. I'll never leave you. But when it gets tough, when there is danger, 
When there is a threat, they will leave your side. And that's what happened to Jesus when the soldiers came. But then Peter takes out his sword and he swings his sword and, and, and Jesus causes him to put it away. Nevertheless, later on, we read in Matthew chapter 26, verse 74, that, that Peter spits out profanity to say, I don't know that man. I was not a follower of him. And then the chief priest judged Jesus. It tells us in Matthew chapter 27, verse 1, when the morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus, put him to death, and they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. And Judas betrayed Jesus. He looked like, he walked like, he talked like a disciple, a follower of Christ, but he was a deceiver. In fact, uh, the way that I see it, Judas was such a deceiver that he even deceived himself. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 27, it tells us, he, I don't think he realized the magnitude of his betrayal until he did it. And he tells them, I've sinned takes the money back that they had given him and they throw the money down and the portrayal compensation of 30 pieces of silver is on the temple floor. And then it tells us in Matthew 27 verse 5 that Judas goes out and hangs himself. And Pilate was confused by Jesus. It's in Matthew 27 verse 14. He knew that the religious leaders were trying to set him up. But what we read is Jesus never said a mumbling word about that. He had come for this purpose, and so he continued to the cross. And think about this. The wife of Pilate feared Jesus. We read in Matthew's gospel, chapter 27, verse 19, that besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife said, have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. And another thing to think about is that the dishonest people rejected Jesus. Again, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 27, 20, it says, Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. And the Roman soldiers mocked Jesus. It tells us in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 26, they scourge him. They beat him with a multi-lashed whip that was embedded with bone and metal. And they strip him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And they press down a crown of thorns upon his head. And they abuse him and they spit on him. And it tells us they struck him in the head with a stick. And then they led him away to be crucified. And Simon of Serene helped Jesus. The weight of the cross was great. And so the Roman soldiers go and they grab this man from Cyrene and they help him, cause him to help Jesus to bear the cross. And then notice that the thieves witnessed the suffering of Jesus. There were thieves on the cross, one on either side, and one of them begins to mock him. But the other says, this man has not done anything. And he says in, math, in Luke chapter 23, verse 42, and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly, it strikes me because at this moment, Jesus pauses his dying. He stops for a moment, shedding his blood. And he says, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. The very essence bemoans the death of Jesus. At his death, it tells us in Matthew 27, beginning at verse 41, that the curtain in the temple is torn in two. This is not just any curtain. This is not a thin curtain. This is a thick curtain that was a separation between the priest and, and the other people. But all of a sudden, this is, this is torn in two, and it tells us that the, the, the earth shook, and, and, and rocks are split, and, and the tomb is open of many. And they see the bodies of people walking and greeting many. And the very borrowed tomb received Jesus. It was Joseph of Arimathea who knows that 
that, that Jesus doesn't have a tomb to be laying in. And so he goes and he asks for the body. It's in Matthew 27, verse 59. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled the great stone, obviously, with help because it's a big stone to the entrance of the tomb. And he went away. And the knights mourned the death of Jesus. Loss was never so severe. Suffering was never so great. Sorrow was never so deep. And the night was never so dark. He was the light of the world. And all of a sudden it appeared as if the light had gone out. But then the borrowed tomb is returned to its owner. It was morning like this that, that the angel whose appearance was like lightning came down to the tomb and the guards who guarded the tomb became like dead men. And Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast many demons, and, and, and Mary, the, the, the mother of James and Joanna and some others came to the tomb and we read in Matthew 28 verse 5 that the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen. And he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you in Galilee. There you will see him. See, I, I've told you. I love that line. Uh, because there's so much that the word of God tells us. There's so much that the word of God shows us. There are so many people who their only time of coming to church is Easter and Christmas. And you hear the message of the cross. You hear the story of what Jesus has done to bring salvation to you. And every time you come, see, I have told you. Don't go away as if you've never heard the story. And later Jesus meets the 11. 11, because Judas is, has hung himself. And in Matthew 28, verse 17, we read, And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Third point, what is triple striking is the implication of the resurrection. The resurrection that we celebrate is marvelous. The resurrection that we celebrate is more significant than anything in your life. You may have experienced some things in your life, you may be experiencing some things in your life, and you may be yet to experience uh, some experience in your life that, that's, that really grips you, that, that really grabs your life, or, or maybe that's things you can, you're concerned about. But the greatest thing that you can ever experience is an encounter with the one who died and rose again. It makes all the difference in the world. And so as we think about the resurrection, we need to know it's not just a Sunday that the Christians come together and say, hey, uh, there's a story about Jesus rising from the dead. And we take one day a year to celebrate that. You need to understand that our celebration is more than one day a year. You need to understand that the celebration is so ingrained in our lives that every day we get up. We have to ask ourselves, was it a morning like this that the Savior rose for me to secure a salvation for me? 
First thought, the resurrection of Jesus means that death is defeated. The very word death conveys separation. Someone has described it as a way in with no way out. It was a way into eternal separation from those who are living. Uh, Someone else says that death is described as a tyrant exercising a reign of terror over the human race. Nobody can escape it. Adam and Eve couldn't escape it. Abraham and Sarah couldn't escape it. Isaac and, and, and Jacob and Moses and David all believed in the promises of God, but they could not escape death. Nevertheless, each of them was conquered by it. Death brought them to a place where there was a way in, but no way out. But when Jesus Christ died, he conquered death. For Christ's people, death may be a way in to separation from the living, but it is not the end. Because of what Christ did, instead, death is a passage that leads to the presence of God. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus means redemption is comprehensive. The message of Easter is not just about Jesus being alive. The message of Easter is about Jesus is risen. Uh, You know that there's a lot of talk about the soul and the spirit and uh, the body. As one pastor writes, he says, God has joined the soul and the body together. Death separates them. This is why it is such a terrible enemy. The survival of the soul separate from the body would not defeat death. Victory over death would only be achieved if the body and the soul were reunited in the power of a new life. That's the good news of the resurrection. There are some people whose body lay in graves, uh, but their spirits are with God. But on that resurrection day, when Christ returns, there is a a reuniting. Uh, I've heard of people whose bodies have been disintegrated uh, by fire or something like that. I've seen someone go out into the lake in Lake Michigan and when we lived in Chicago and scatter the ashes of someone who has died because that person loved the water and so they had them cremated and they scattered the ashes. But God is great. It doesn't matter whether your body is laying in a grave. It doesn't matter whether your body's been burned and the ashes have been scattered. There is a day coming for the saints of God where every particle of that body will come back together and be changed and reunited with the Spirit and spend an eternity with God in heaven. Uh, You know, there are times in my life that um, I blame the seniors uh, who go to this church. I mean, there's some good seniors here, good people, known them for years. I'm, I'm blessed by the fact that they allow me to be the pastor for as long as I've been the pastor. But, but I do blame them because one of two things has happened. Either they have told me that, hey, when you get older, there's some things that happens to your body that you may not be ready for. Now, either they told me that, and I didn't listen, or they just didn't tell me. There are some things that happen to your body that sometimes make you feel as if, oh, Lord, if I could be separate from this body. I know that through personal experience. But there are some people whose personal experience has been birth defects or mental disorders or a medical problem, Uh, whichever the case may be, our desire is to be free from a plague-ridden body, from aging organs and limbs, and from the inevitability of physical death. But I ran across the words of one preacher, and this is what he says. He says, the life God promises to his people in heaven is unlike a virtual tour. It is not a spiritual experience or a mind game. God sent his son to redeem the whole of you and bring you body and soul into his presence. The good news is that Christ is risen. The resurrection of the body is the glorious future that lies ahead of every Christian believer. I don't know how he's going to do it. But somehow, wherever your body is after death, God will bring that thing together and he'll reunite it with the soul. It will be a glorified body. 
It'll be a different body. It'll be a body that's not held down by the weight of this world. Somebody might throw a rock at that body. You can't hit it. Somebody may try to set that body on fire. You can't burn it. This will be a glorified body. That's what we have to look forward to. And thirdly, the resurrection of Jesus means we shall be changed. When Lazarus died, he's laying in a tomb and Jesus goes and he raises him from the dead. Amen. Hallelujah. In Acts, there's a young man who's sitting in the window and he's listening to the sermon being preached and he falls asleep and he falls out the window and he dies. And then he's resurrected from the dead. Amen. Hallelujah. That's powerful. There is one thing, however, that after they were resurrected, they grew old and they eventually died. They had to die again. Uh, but when Jesus' body was raised, it was also changed. His body was no longer subject to aging. It was not susceptible to hunger or thirst or sickness. It was transformed and adapted for eternity. Think about that for a minute, that when your body is resurrected, if you are in Christ, your body shall be transformed. It shall be adapted for eternity. His death and resurrection not only paid the penalty for sin, his death and resurrection was a precursor to exactly what will happen to his followers on that day when he comes and is appointed to all human beings once to die. Nevertheless, for those who know Christ, there is eternal life as a spirit in a glorified body. I ran across this statement by one pastor. He says, the greatest delights of body and soul are in the life, are in this life, are only a hint of what God is preparing for those who love him. Fourth and finally, what is beyond striking is that he's coming back again. Yeah, amen. Jesus was a lamb of God, sacrificed to pay the penalty for sin. And now that slain lamb is in preparation for his return. That boggles my mind. That, that blows me away. Because I know how imperfect I am. I know the mess ups that I've done and probably, maybe, perhaps may have a few more mess ups in my future. I know how I get off at times. I know how I gave my life to Christ and allowed him to become Lord of my soul. And yet, after having done that, I still make mistakes. I still say the wrong things sometimes. I know that's hard for you to believe. <laughs> I still trip up sometimes. As holy as I might appear, Cynthia still has to straighten me out sometimes. And, and if everything else was hard to believe, this is really hard to believe. There are some times that she is right and I'm wrong. Somebody's talking back there, and you shouldn't be talking because I'm afraid of what you're saying about me. <laughs> but Jesus is coming back for flawed individuals like me. He's coming back for people who are not perfect, they make mistakes. People who know that uh, He's risen indeed. But still, sometimes they live their lives like there is no God. And I love the book of Revelation because it gives us a glimpse into the preparation for his return. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of the incense which are the prayers of the saints. Love that. That God is saving your prayers. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its scowls. For you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people 
for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. I love the fact that that doesn't leave anybody out. As a young person, uh, growing up in the small town where I grew up, um, Ku Klux Klan was, were, were not a, a group that uh, hid themselves. I grew up in Indiana. And, and, and when somebody tells you that you're not anything or you're nothing much just because of the color of your skin, that can wear on you. Well, let's take it out of racism. Somebody can tell you that you're nothing much simply because you can't do the things that they can do or you haven't accomplished the things that they've accomplished. And you can begin to feel like, I, I, I'm not much. But when you find out that there is a Savior who died for you, because regardless of your nationality, regardless of the shade of your skin, regardless of what country you've come from, regardless of what language you speak, this Savior died for all people. He says every nation, every language Everybody. And then in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 5, it says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders and a voice of many angels mumbling. I love this. Myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor, and glory, and blessing. And then he goes on to say, and I heard every creature in heaven. I love that. And then he says, and on the earth, every creature. And then he says, and under the earth. Where are they? On he in heaven, on the earth and under the earth. Everything and, and everyone. And then he says, and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and power forever. That's not it. He doesn't just say forever. He adds, and ever. Now, how long is that? I don't know. But I have a suspicion that that's a long time. And he says in verse 14, and the four living creatures said, amen. And the, and the elders, I, I'd be with the elders. You know, the four living creatures are saying, amen. They're the ones who say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. But, but they're saying amen, but the elders just fall down. That's me. I, I don't think I'd be able to speak. Just fall down before the Lord. And maybe that's where you are in your life. Maybe you've experienced all kinds of things. Maybe you're here just because it's Easter Sunday. Uh, maybe you're here because somebody invited you. Hey, come to my church. It'll be fun to come to my church. And I'm glad you're here. And so are the people who are members of this church. But let me tell you something. There has got to be a point in your life where you recognize the need to fall down before the Lord. You can't save yourself. You can't redeem yourself. You can't die and rise for anybody. Christ has beat you in doing that. You have to make a choice. Fall down like the elders and worship him, recognizing that he is worthy. The resurrection of Christ is marvelous. It is, it is wonderful. I am struck and blown away by the fact that he would come for me. Some of you know me. Some of you have held conversations with me. Uh, some of you, I'm ashamed to say, know that I'm not perfect. I know the same thing about you. But there is a perfect Savior who has given his life for you. Don't, 
Don't leave this place walking in the same deception that you may have come in with. Be struck by the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done something. He's done a miracle. Despite our sinful estate, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I love this. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes this is not condemned. I remember as a young person when I heard the preacher say, whoever believes this, whoever trusts in Christ is not condemned, but they have eternal life. Let me just say that there are a lot of things in life uh, that may say that you have a guarantee and you find out later on it's not really a guarantee. You, you have to pay something. You have to give something in order to get the guarantee. And then even when you get the guarantee, you find out there are some, are some attachments. There's still some things that you have to do. But if you want something that is truly a guarantee, this is it. The miracle is that the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. And another truth is that he went away, but he's coming back again. And the question is, will you be ready for his return? The gratitude of what Jesus has done can cause you to say hallelujah. I know that's true for me. There are those moments when I just think about hallelujah because of what Christ has done. That's what Resurrection Sunday is about. That's what I like to refer to it as, is Resurrection Sunday, is we are celebrating what he has done. We are celebrating that he came. We are celebrating that he rose from the dead. But there is also something else that I celebrate. I celebrate the fact that he is coming back again. And knowing that causes me to say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The four and 20 elders didn't say a word. They just fell down before him and worshiped. Maybe that's something you need to think about. Maybe in your worshiping him, you will recognize your great need for him. That without him, you're nothing, but with him, you can do all things except fail. Don't let another day go by that you don't take the opportunity to have something that is absolutely free. It is salvation through the Savior who died and rose again to save your soul. Amen? Amen. Amen.